Good evening. Good evening and welcome to uh, all of you on this uh, quite treacherous day, but still very beautiful day. Uh, my name is Vlad Spikanovic, I'm Dean of the Faculty of Art here at Okhad University, and I would like to thank you all for coming out and joining us for a public talk by Ralph Rugov. Ralph, we are delighted to have you here and to host your talk at Okhad University, Canada's oldest and largest specialized university of art, media, and design. Okhad University acknowledges the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Chodnishane, the Anishnabi, and the Huron Wendat, who are the original owners and custodians of the land on which we live, work, and create. I would like to also observe that my early introduction to work and visual vision of Mr. Rugov was several years ago at the Hayward Gallery, at a time when the gallery showcased an incredibly exciting exhibition called Psycho Buildings, which explored an incredibly fertile and intricate relationship between art and architecture, and I'm still remembering quite well the courage and curiosity that Ralph brought to Hayward along the many artists and architects for that particular show. So we're thrilled to have you here, Ralph. Before our distinguished guest is introduced, um, let me take this opportunity to thank first the Power Plant for sharing their amazing programming and international lecture series with Okad University. Last September, uh, we were happy to uh, host an artist talk by Michael Landy here at Okad U in, tan in tandem with Landy's exhibition at the Power Plant. Since then, we have developed uh, and signed an agreement between Okad U and the Power Plant that will allow us to bring some of the leading international artists and curators to Okad and integrate their expertise in the art world wisdom with educational experience of our students and faculty. Such cross-institutional collaboration promises to strengthen the links between the contemporary art exhibitions and the education of artists and designers, allowing our students to expand their understanding of art and design and deepen their professional capacity. In closing, I would like to thank some of the people who made this event possible, from Mokhead U, Glenn Lowry, John Rubino, Christine Crosby, Fernando Cicotosto, and from Power Plant, Josh Hoyman, Sabrina Meyer, as well as always visionary and inspiring Gethan Werner. Um, I would like to bring forward Tim Chandler, a TD Curator of Education Fellow, who will introduce Mr. Rugov. So thank you again for being here, and welcome to Mokhead U. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Vlad, for that very nice intro. I think mine will be like decidedly less poetic. Um, but like uh, Vlad said, my name's Tim Chandler, so I'm the TD Curator of Education Fellow at the Power Plant, which basically means I, uh, I always play a hand in organizing all of our public and education programs at the gallery. Um, so the Power Plant is located at Harborfront Center. I know most people here are probably familiar with us, as I know we have a lot of members here and other people who are involved in the Power Plant in various ways. But we focus on presenting the best in contemporary art from Canada and or Canadian and international artists. We are currently coming to the end of our winter 2018 exhibitions, featuring a site-specific installation by Michael Landy, a sound installation by Emeka Ogbo, and work from Kader Atia, which is uh, why we brought Ralph to speak today. So these uh, exhibitions will be on for just about a month longer. So uh, admission is always free at the power plant and I encourage everybody to come down and see the shows if you haven't seen them yet, or if you have already seen them, come see them another time. Um, in addition to this, as you can see on the slideshow looping beside me, we also have a vast array of public programs, whether it be you know, talks like you're here for tonight, with you know, a major figure from the art world, or uh, you know, assorted workshops and things like that where you can indulge your artistic side uh, with us. Um, I would also be uh, remiss to not thank OCAD U for all their help in organizing this event, uh, specifically Vlad, John, and Glenn. You are all a huge help to us. Uh, but So today we are presenting the next uh, talk in our international lecture, lecture series, which has been ongoing at the gallery for quite a while now. Uh, and it's been actually almost a year since the last one, so I'm happy to see this series come back. Uh, so our speaker today is, of course, Ralph Rugoff, who has been most well known as the director of the Hayward Gallery, a renowned contemporary art gallery in uh, London's South Bank Center since 2006. Uh, Rugoff was 
somehow uh, more impressively recently announced in December 2017 as the artistic director of the 58th Venice Biennial, which will take place in 2019. He uh, curated the 13th Biennial of Lyon in 2015 and initiated and co-curated Baja to Vancouver, the West Coast and Contemporary Art in 2003. A prolific writer about art for numerous publications, Rugoff spent six years as director of CCA Wattis Institute at the California College of the Arts San Francisco prior to the Hayward. So having said all this, please join me in welcoming Ralph Rugoff to the stage. PowerPoint moment. Uh, thanks for those introductions. And uh, I'd say to anybody who hasn't been down to the power plant that you should definitely go tomorrow because uh, these are three great artists who are down there. So I'm super excited about getting down there myself. Um, we've just, uh, the Hayward was just closed for two and a half years because we had to renovate the building and take off the roof and put a new roof on. It's a much better roof, so it was worth it in the end. Um, but it was a very frustrating period when we were closed and your whole, the meaning of your existence just evaporates and the thing that keeps you alive is seeing people come into a gallery and, and have this experience of art. So we managed to do one exhibition in an abandoned office building across the river from us, uh, which was a show of 10 large uh, video installations. Um, and I gather one of those pieces ended up at the AGO, a wonderful piece by Dominique Gonzalez Foster that's kind of a, looks like a hologram of the artist singing as Maria Callas. But we finally reopened at the end of January and the first show that we reopened with, and this is also our 50th anniversary year, and um, I don't have any good pictures of it, but the Hayward is a really special building, it's a great, brutalist, very experimental building from really designed in the mid-60s, finally opened in 1968, and it lends itself to exhibitions that don't always work in other places or that other places won't even try to do, whereas there's some things that Hayward's not very good for, and I've offered shows to some couple of wonderful painters there who said, no, that space is just too much for my work. So, but it's good for some things, and so this 50th anniversary year, we wanted to look at artists who really engage with architecture. And for the first show, we opened with a retrospective of uh, Andreas Gursky. Uh, it's 40 years of his pictures. And, you know, as a curator, there are many different things you like to do. Sometimes it's really exciting to do things that break all the rules, like um, the show Cycle Buildings that we did, for instance, where one of the Hayward's three sculpture terraces, these outdoor terraces, was turned into a boating pond and you could row as if you were gonna row off the edge of the boating pond and that was just one of many things that were challenging but really interesting to do. Sometimes you wanna show artists that no one else has shown in your city, but one of the most interesting things also is to take an artist who everybody thinks they know really well and show them in a different light and to bring out things about their work that are really wonderful things and neglected things. And working on the show with Andreas Gursky for me was that kind of project. He's extremely well known, uh, but in a way he's become well known for the wrong things. He became known for someone who made really big, spectacular, incredibly detailed photographs that sold for millions of dollars and that kind of chronicled emblematic sites of global capitalism. And, you know, there was, that's all true, but he also is an incredibly thoughtful artist who from the very beginning of his career has been making pictures about the nature of picture making and how we look at pictures and how, what pictures can tell us about the world and what they can't. And I thought that the more I started talking to him, but especially just thinking about his work, 
the more I found in it, and uh, I kind of became a bit of a true believer. So I'm going to talk about this show for a little bit, and um, then I'm going to leave a lot of time, I hope, for questions and just discussions. So we can talk about anything at that moment. So if somebody can tell me when it's about 22, let's see, what's that? Quarter past eight, I guess? All right. Just shout it out. Don't even, because I'll, I'll forget. Um, so this is really a, maybe the first, one of the first really important pictures that Gursky took, and it looks really banal. But he's someone who's really interested in banality. And it's a picture of a hiking path in the Swiss Alps. And when he took this, he was quite far away, and he took it because a friend said, hey, that's a really nice rock over there. Why don't you make a picture of it? He didn't realize that there were actually people on the side of the mountain. And then when he blew up the print and he saw these people, he was really interested. He thought he had discovered something because the people all had really kind of awkward poses. They didn't look remotely at home in nature and on this mountainside. They looked like they were standing around their backyard or uh, you know, even just hanging out in their living room. And they were obviously like fish out of water. And he thought that this picture then said something about our relationship to the landscape. That we have this fantasy that drives us to go and spend a day hiking somewhere. But when we get there, we realize this environment has nothing to do with us. We don't really belong there anymore. And he realized that by taking a long shot, a long view, a distance perspective, he could kind of show this relationship, how large groups of people related to the environment they were in. Um, and he made a number of pictures like this then around Dusseldorf. Now let's see, if I hit an arrow, hopefully that'll do it. Uh, you know, here he's just put the camera behind these people who are at the local airport on a Sunday watching planes land and take off. You know things are really slow in your town when that's a form of entertainment. <laughs> um, but he's put the camera behind them and t so that you really get a sense that this is the, you're seeing their point of view. Um, and it is about, it's about a certain, about people looking. This is also becomes one of his early subjects, is how people look at the world around them, as a, sometimes as a show or as a spectacle. Uh, this is a picture of uh, just a group of people out by the woods, totally ignoring where they are and having you know, a, a little conference as people do. Um, and you know, these works which he was making while he was still a student, he was studying at the Kunstakademie in Dusseldorf, which is a really famous art school in Germany where Gerhard Richter, Joseph Beuys taught there, and Gursky was studying uh, with the Beckers, two very famous, a couple who very famous photographers uh, who also had other students who became Thomas Truth and Thomas Ruth and Candida Hofer and other photographers. But most of them, and especially Andreas, were influenced by a group of photographers in North America in the 1970s called the New Topographics. And this is uh, a picture by Stephen Shore from 1979 called uh, Merced River. Yosemite. Yosemite is this famous natural park in California. Um, but Stephen and Ansel Adams famously took these amazing pictures of this majestic nature there. But Stephen Shore wasn't interested in majestic nature. He was interested in this national park as a site of leisure, as a social place. And this idea that landscape could be looked at as a social environment, not a natural environment, was a shift that really happened in the 70s. Um, and one of the people who picked it up also uh, was Jeff Wall, uh, Mrs. Steve's Farm, a picture from 1980. Um, and it's showing you an area on the outskirts of Vancouver where suburban sprawl is meeting kind of agricultural land, uh, kind of what we might call nature. Uh, maybe there's a little industrial 
environment thrown in too. And I think it's, I think in general, I think artists are almost always interested in looking at things where categories are breaking down, definitions and distinctions are blurring, and you can create an image that's sort of in between things we can easily identify. And I think in this case, that was the sense of these overlapping categories of landscape. Is this a landscape image? Is it an image of the suburbs? What is it actually about? Uh, and uh, it's funny, Gursky did his own, oops. Yeah, here's a picture of the actual installation at the Hayward, uh, the first room. And this is one of the pictures there uh, from 1989. A little hard to see perhaps, but um, you see some people fishing along the banks of what looks like a river. And in the background, it's hard to see in this slide, I think. It's, there's a concrete motorway bridge. And in fact, it's not even a river. It's just a, a dead end waterway created by a huge hydroelectric plant that's on the other side of this dam. So Gursky, who's photographing in the Ruhr Valley, which is a part of Germany that's a mix of green belt, habitat, but also a lot of industry, is making a picture that looks initially like something Poussin might have painted. But in fact, is showing you this quasi-industrial landscape where the guys who are fishing there on a Sunday are listening to the sounds of the motorway, the traffic going by, they're hearing the dam. It's not what it looks like. And I think that's one of the interesting things about a lot of Andreas's work is it's big, the detail is very fastidious and precise, but they're very ambiguous often. You don't know what the subject really is until you've thought about it. Um, you know, here's another picture. This one's a little more explicit in, in kind of evoking the ghost of, say, romantic imagery of landscape imagery where you have a single person looking out of the distance, you know, only here this person is framed again by this huge industrial structure. Um, and, uh, in these kinds of pictures, I think Andreas is not really interested in, in depicting a particular place because it's got interesting visual qualities. He's interested in a place that's a metaphor that says something about the world around it, us and how it's changing. In this case, how, we're, how our fantasy is in a way, this collective fantasy and desire to have some kind of nature experience which advertisers, of course, love to play on, including four-wheel drive vehicle company advertising always seems to be out in the middle of nowhere, right? But you're gonna be driving that car in Toronto. <laughs> um, but this idea that those desires are actually really fantasies uh, and they don't reflect our experience in the world anymore. And can, can photography take that as a subject? rather than a landscape. So these are pictures really about relationships, not about places. And I think German art historians love to cite all kinds of uh, painterly precedents for Andreas's landscape pictures that go back to the 15th century. Um, but actually, Jeff Wall was a much bigger influence. And I think Jeff was somebody who really besides being one of the first photographers to make really big prints and to introduce a supposedly commercial format, the light box. Um, but he also was somebody who looked at the image as something that was not about what it depicted, that the content of the picture wasn't what you were seeing, right? That was the starting point. And Andreas, I think, really took that from Jeff and developed it in his own way. So here he's also looking at how architecture, if we consider this pool a piece of architecture, mediates our relationship with nature. Uh, I thought I took this slide out. This is a very mysterious picture, which you can't even see, I don't think, in this slide, but there's a very thin wire. Can anyone see that? That's a diagonal going across the picture and disappearing. You can barely see it. Um, very strange picture. Uh, as is this, um, 
which looks like some strange park. Not quite sure where it might be, but it turns out it's actually a photo mural in a restaurant in Indonesia. So again, this is where Gursky starts to play around with even your expectations of what you're looking at. What is a landscape? How can you make, how can you talk about what landscapes are with your photographs rather than just make new landscapes? And how can you start to really look at the limits of landscapes and also extend the possibilities? And that's something uh, we really got into in the second room in this exhibition. Uh, this is a picture he took of three Turner kind of seascapes. These are actually, this, the pictures are at the Tate Britain in London. Um, but Gursky, who's normally using this super precise focus, actually used a slightly blurry uh, approach on this. And he exaggerated the already kind of misty, amorphous, you know, uh, cloudy Turner effect, right? I mean, Turner's creating this kind of sublime uh, formlessness. But then, of course, in the museum, what happens to that sublime formlessness? It's regimented by these golden frames, by the architecture, the way it's installed, and it suddenly looks very orderly. Um, I think that's, for me, that's what this picture is sort of talking about. Uh, this was the first untitled picture Andreas made in 1993 called Untitled One. And it's a picture of a gray carpet. <laughs> it's a huge picture. It's about, I don't know, seven by, are you guys using feet or meters here? Feet? Okay. It's about, um, you know, six by eight feet. Uh, and there's the light sort of gradually gets lighter as you go through it. When you look up close to the picture, you can see all the marks in the carpet, the cuts, the stains. But from a far away, it looks totally abstract. But it could be a landscape. It is really a landscape. But it's also, in a way, a reference to uh, an earlier picture by Gerhard Richter from 1970, Untitled Gray Painting. And this was a period when Richter was really trying to reach a degree zero of painting, to work with gray, the most neutral color, to have something that had no subject. And could you still have a painting under those conditions? And I think Andreas's untitled photograph is talking about this, but it's also, it is a document of something. It's abstract-ish, but it is also a picture of a carpet. And I think he's, looking at the way photography can talk about abstraction, but at the same time uh, talk about other things um, and raise questions about what actually is an appropriate subject for a picture. You know, he was actually just coming out of a show, walking through this gallery, which was the Kunstverein in Dusseldorf, and looking down at the gray carpet in that kind of day state you're in after you've seen too much art. And I think he had suddenly had this experience of this kind of endless expanse of grayness, and he wanted to see if he could make a picture of it. Um, this is a different kind of evocation of a kind of endless gray expanse that's coming in. Um, you know, this was one of those freaky, Andreas, I guess this happens to really good photographers. They're, they always say they get lucky. And this time he said he was just hiking and he saw this cloud coming in and he had 10 minutes to take a picture. And he managed to get two pictures off before the cloud engulfed this little gondola. Um, but I love the fact that it's sort of about these people who are in this little bubble so they can see things. And they're about to lose that ability to see things. <laughs> uh, it's precarious. We take it so for granted, our, uh, this world that we can look at as if we're watching television, which is what this picture, I think, is sort of about. This is called Ship Hall. It's at the airport. And you get this picture of the world outside as if it's, you know, kind of in a glass vitrine. And uh, Susan Sontag and her amazing 
still a great book on photography, talks about how the camera makes tourists of us all. That we, whether or not you have a camera in front of you, you start to see the world as if you were looking through a lens, as if the world was on the other side of this piece of glass. And I think in this moment where we now upload a billion photographs every day to the internet, this feeling of looking at the world as something that exists on the other side of your phone um, is more and more with us. Um, so this again is what, you know, this is a way to make a landscape that's talking about lots of other things besides landscape. Uh, these are two pictures about how landscapes are actually constructed. Uh, these are some guys on the side of the road laying down this structure over which they can then put plant shrubs and eventually it will look like some natural shrubbery exists on the side of the road, but it's completely man-made illusion of nature. And for anyone here who's a painter and has ever worked up a grid in order to work on a canvas, I think it's almost evoking that idea of the world is an image. The world we live in is a constructed. When you take a picture of it, you're taking a picture of an image that already has been created, that's already been constructed. And this is another picture, I think, which is talking about the same thing. This is the Amsterdam football arena and some people laying down the grass before a game. And it's just a picture of a landscape being made. Uh, uh, this room actually doesn't look like that, but uh, something weird happened to that slide. It's actually a square room. Um, but this was a room uh, that looked at really these three key works from 1990 when uh, Gursky started to move away from landscape and started to look at the global economy. And this was a picture of the Tokyo Stock Exchange uh, that he took. And it was really one of the first pictures he made that had no center. Uh, there's no focal point. You know, we. We're used to seeing images of the stock exchange in the newspaper whenever there's a big move in the market. And it's almost the same image every time. It's a couple of traders frantically trying to buy or sell something, right? This rarely happens anymore. There are rarely any stock exchanges left that have people on them. But we need that image in the newspapers to convey an idea of the stock exchange. So this is 1990 in Japan. And, you know, if you squint a little bit, it's starts to look like an abstract expressionist composition. It's got an all over composition, something we associate with that kind of abstraction. Only it's not, it's talking, and this I think is very interesting, when Gursky uses abstraction, he's really talking about, he usually is talking about abstraction in the world we live in. And in this case, I think he's talking about a global economy, which at this point in time, it was clear there was no longer a single center anymore. It was an overall interconnected thing. And this is an image of that. Um, Japan in 1990 was set to surpass the United States as the world's preeminent economic power. It looked like the whole east-west shift was about to change forever. Um, now we think that's gonna happen with China, but in 1990 it really was Japan. Uh, and this was a picture he made just before that of a port in Salerno. And again, it's an image, you know, he says that one of the things he's really interested in is using photography to understand how the world is constituted, how all its different parts fit together. And here he's found the one point of view that shows you a city from the mountains in the back and the clouds that encircle it to the apartment buildings, the office buildings, and then it's global trade. All these automobiles uh, that are the docks, all the cargo containers that they've come out of or are about to go into. And there's a sense here again of that abstraction and that he's using all these repeated elements. I mean, you look at the cars lined up and they start to take on the character of this kind of a comprehensive, rather than a single subject, it's weaving together these repeated structural elements. Um, and then finally, this was a picture he made in a, a factory, Siemens factory, where the workers 
seem to have almost disappeared into this network of cables and wires and desks. And, you know, it's an image, I think, of, uh, you know, a very different idea of what a factory is, you know, from this kind of industrial age idea of what a factory is to something that's sort of the post-industrial factory. Uh, now this was a picture we placed, uh, this is a Kodak building in China actually, and we placed this at the end of the first three rooms of the exhibition to let people know that we were saying goodbye to straight photography at this point. <laughs> Every image I've shown you has been an untouched straight photograph. But beginning in the early 90s, Gursky started to use software to edit multiple images together. Um, and he got something very different. Uh, and this is really one of the first key pictures that resulted from this change in approach. This is the largest housing block, post-war housing block in Paris, with something like 3,000 residents, 750 apartments. Um, and if you shot this from the middle of the building across the street, you would have perspectival foreshortening, right? Because the ends of the building are further away, the windows would look smaller and smaller. And Andreas wanted to communicate the idea of the building, the idea of the architects, this idea of a grid, that every space is regulated it is the same size and that it can be repeated endlessly and he's given you that feeling by cutting off the building it kind of runs off either end of the frame so in order to get that sense of this r perfectly regular grid he took two pictures from two different vantage points across the street each about uh, one third of the way from the edge so that he pretty much got rid of that it also allowed him so you get an image with a lot more detail. Um, and when you actually look at this print, which is four and a half meters long, so that's about 13, 14 feet long, you can look into every single apartment and you can see what the furniture is. Sometimes there's somebody standing there. Uh, and in a way, it, each window is like a photograph and it's like you're looking at 750 photographs at the same time. Um, in one way, it's a very kind of democratic image in that every part of the picture is, no part of the picture is more important than any other part of the picture. Um, I think, you know, Le Corbusier famously called buildings machines for living. And part of that dream of modernist architecture was that if we all lived in perfectly regulated spaces, we would have uh, a well-behaved society where there were no problems. And I think one of the things Gursky is often interested in is a conflict between this desire for order and actually the entropy of real life. And when you look at this from across a room, you see the difference. He's making visible what the actual interior structure of this business building is, and everybody's decorated their place in a different way. So you get a very strong sense that this is completely random the way the flats look next to each other uh, despite this very rigid structure of the building. Uh, this was a picture that I, I swore this must have been a collage because of this kind of funny pun of Toyota and Toys R Us, but this was actually a straight picture. Uh, and then this is a picture from 1999 of a 99-cent store that I think, you know, will be one of the key pictures 100 years from now when people are trying to understand what this, what this period of capitalism was like. Because um, the 99-cent store is sort of the grease that keeps the wheels of capitalism going. This is where you go, and this is the key point, the candy rack where you get three bars for 99 cents and you get instant gratification. You put that sugar in your mouth and everything feels good. It was all worth it. Um, but he's amped up the colors in this. This is where he's also starting to digitally tweak the color. And you can see on the ceiling, you can just see it in this slide, uh, he's created a kind of 
ghostly mirror image of the shop as if there were mirrors up there. And that's all uh, something he's added to make it feel slightly more claustrophobic. Um, I mean, I have to say one thing about Andreas's work is you have to see it in person to understand it. Even looking at it on a big screen, you don't get the detail and you're not seeing it. This is actually a little model that we made of the Hayward when we were trying to figure out where things would go because these things are really big. They're really heavy. They weigh about 500 pounds, these framed big pictures. Uh, but Andreas con consistently told me, Ralph, whatever we do in the model, it's not going to mean anything. When we get in the gallery, we're going to throw it all away and start from scratch. I really didn't want to agree with this because I knew that, for one thing, some of these pictures, most actually most of them, were too big to fit in the freight lift at the Hayward. So we had a crane the ones into the upper galleries, because we're on two levels, onto our sculpture terraces, bring them in the building that way. So once they were up there, we couldn't get them down again uh, without having to pay for a crane, which is very expensive. <laughs> um, so we went through many, many iterations on the model, and he built this beautiful model in his studio, 1 to 25 scale with magnetic walls so you could slap the images up, move them around. Um, and we'd change it, we'd get really excited. I'd say, great, I think we've nailed it. I'd go back to London, and then two weeks later, he'd say, I've changed everything. It's much better now. And we'd start to have another discussion. Um, the hardest thing for me was that Andreas has a really interesting idea about how to hang a show. And he wants his pictures to be seen as singular things that have no relationship to anything else in the room. So he wants each, he doesn't want there to be any dialogue between the pictures that are in a room. Now, if you're a curator, that's your raison d'etre, is to try to create interesting conversations between these different works that are in a room. And I would try to say, Andreas, look, if we don't do it, people are going to still make connections between these works. And they're not going to have such a rewarding time because they're going to be hard to make those connections. But for him, each picture was like an autonomous thing. The other problem was he didn't want to have any chronological sequencing. And to me, it was really important that people got a sense of how he got to where he got to, to understand it. And I'd seen several shows of his which were completely achronological, and they all felt the same. It all felt a little random to me why these works were with these works. Um, and again, this took a lot of conversation, a lot of discussion. And finally, he agreed to having the first three or four galleries more or less chronological. And then it kind of became thematic after that. And I think it kind of worked. Um, I mean, I, you know, it was int an interesting process for both of us. Uh, we were both very wary of the other guy, like, and we ended up, I think, both being pretty happy with the way things turned out. Um, but this is a, sh a picture of a, a rave in Dortmund that, that happens every year, and Andreas has made many pictures of it. And there are about 300 people in the photograph who you can see very distinctly. Each one's in their own subjective little narrative bubble. It's a four different pictures that he put together. Uh, but really, it feels like it's about, I don't know, 20 pictures that have been put together. And you realize that when you're making photographs this way, and you know he's, he's doing this not to change the nature of reality, but to show you, in a way, more precisely what, this world, what something looks like. So with that Montparnasse building, he use the software to sh just to put two images together so he could show you what the actual structure of the building looked like. And here, rather than have lots of blurry bodies, he wants to show you what actually the people on the dance floor look like. But you suddenly realize that this kind of photography is not about capturing a moment. It's almost more like film. It's about sequencing multiple moments in one image. 
Um, and this is a, a factory, a picture of a factory in Vietnam, uh, where, you know, it's a factory, and yet the almost uh, women, they're all women, who, and they're making rattan baskets and furniture that Ikea sells. And uh, so it's a craft-like labor, but it's industrialized. So it's, this again, this kind of strange thing. What is it? Um, so this is an actual image of the Hayward of two images that show very different kinds of crowds. And the crowd is one of uh, Andreas's great subjects. And because of the detail in his pictures, a lot of these images are about, in a way, this relationship of an individual to a crowd, uh, because you can see the individuals. And this is a spectacle that happens every year in North Korea, in P Pyongyang. It's a special event dedicated to the former dictator, Kim Jong-un. And uh, that kind of apocalyptic sky in the background is actually something like 20,000 high school students holding up colored boards, which they can then flip over. Uh, it's like the analog version of digital <laughs> photography. But what's interesting in these pictures is it looks like, oh my God, it's all about perfect symmetry and timing. But when you actually look in up close, you see that there are all kinds of things gone wrong. People's costumes are wrong. People are not moving in sync. So it's one of these things that, again, it looks like one thing, and then you get closer up and you realize it's about something else. It's about the inevitable fallibility of our impulses towards perfection um, and complete control. And this is a crowd that is not in the picture. It's a shot of workers' clothing. This is the last working coal mine in Germany. And this is where, at the end of a shift, people hang up their dirty clothes. But it's this, to me, it's a ghostly crowd. It evokes all these people who are not actually there. Um, this is a different kind of crowd in Greeley, Colorado. And I mean, I think, for me, one of the important things about Andreas's work is he's dealing with a lot of issues about photography and making pictures and how we look at things. But he's also showing us things that are very t key things about the world we live in. And industrial agriculture obviously is one of them. Um, how people work in factories. How, what mass leisure is like. Um, you know, he's said that he's really not interested in individuals, he's interested in the species. He's, he's looking at the big picture. Um, and, you know, one critic uh, in London said, gee, you know, these pictures are all right, but they're sort of cold. And it's true, he's using a distant perspective, and they're not about people and psychological relationships. But I think he's giving us a very intense, maybe even intimate version of what the structures that shape us are like including the architecture we live in and the social structures, um, including shops. And his father was a commercial photographer. He grew up, really, his bedroom was the extra studio. Uh, and this is a picture he took of uh, some empty Prada shelves, which for me, he'd, it's interesting. He'd taken pictures of shelves filled with shoes and other things. And then I think this, which looks like a kind of a Dan Flavin installation, maybe if Dan Flavin and Donald Judd were collaborating. Um, but to me, this is about the frame being the most important thing. That what really arouses your desire is how these objects are framed and presented. And this is like this transcendent frame. Anything would look great in there. And museums are frames where things that you might not notice outside suddenly look, catch your attention. And obviously, the camera is a way of framing the world. And that's a key part of phot photography. And Gursky is constantly using that to talk about the way our experience is framed um, in many different ways. Uh, and this is uh, one of his most famous pictures, which is sort of a melancholy picture because there's nothing attractive about this river. Uh, and in this case, there actually was a factory 
on the other side of the river and some other buildings that he removed. But I think the river itself is a factory product now. He's, he's shown you an industrial version of this river. This is outside of Dusseldorf. He used to jog on this path. Uh, and it's sort of about the, the way we like to have a controlled nature. We like nature to behave itself. Is it time to have uh, questions? All right, so I'm going to stop right there. Um, and let's see if there are any questions about anything. Yes, we have a microphone. So if you raise your hand, I can bring you the mic so everybody can hear you when you ask. If you don't ask questions, you might end up in this place. <laughs> this is a state penitentiary in Illinois, the last prison uh, designed on the principles of Jeremy Bentham, the British 19th century social reformer who created the Panopticon. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. It, it's um, really fascinating conversation about the work. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, his working method, like how he works with sight? Um, does he spend time there? Does he know the people who, um, in a sense, control the site? Um, how much is he an observer, a participant? Um, a little bit about his working method would be really interesting. I mean, as you can see from pictures like this and also this, which shows you a neutrino observatory one kilometer under the ground in Japan, um, he is often going into places that you need special permission to go to. And after his first eight or nine years where he's photographing landscapes and he's, look, he's centered in Dusseldorf, and he begins to sort of look at the global economy as a subject and to travel, he starts to, he's no longer relying just on interesting things he sees. He starts to read newspapers and magazines to find subjects to find images which he thinks he can remake. So his research process then involves having to con go and visit the site. A lot of times, it, like going to North Korea, it involves layers of permissions. Um, and so it can take two or three years to make a picture. And then um, some later pictures are being composed from, say, 100 different images. So the actual process of doing that can take months. Um, and then you've got to color correct it, everything else. So he does a lot of research. He goes, he makes multiple visits to a site. And you know, in 40 years of photographing, he's only made 240 pictures. So that's an average of about six a year. And a lot of them, in the early years, he was popping off 10 or 12 a year. So he slowed down <laughs> as they've gotten more complicated. I mean, this is a funny picture where, uh, that's just to give you a sight of the size. This is a completely fictional picture. Um, and he got into this also after making very, playing with abstraction. He got into the idea, well, let's, let's actually make pictures that are completely speculative. And this shows you the back of the last four chancellors of Germany, Gerhard Schroeder, Helmut Schmidt, Angela Merkel, and Helmut Kohl. They're aligned left to right based on their political affiliations. Uh, and they're in front of this amazing Barnett Newman painting, which actually sits in the Museum of Modern Art, which has this insane title, this is 1950 abstraction, called Man, Heroic and Sublime. So you've got four heads of state looking at this artist's idea of heroic and sublime mankind, but they're screwing up the picture because suddenly Helmut Schmidt smoke is now part of Barnett Newman's picture. Uh, and Gorski's added this, they're in this strange, like it looks like a recording booth and there's this big black pane on the window that comes down that covers up a thinner stripe on the painting. So Gursky's also screwing around with this image. And Barnett Newman said this wonderful thing about this picture. You know, he said, how is it possible to make sublime art in a time when there are no legends? And he said, yeah, I, I think we can do it with scale, but you know, and, and you can 
that his goal was that an encounter between someone and a painting would be like an encounter with another person. And that in any interesting encounter between two people, both people go away slightly changed. And somehow this image for me is talking about that interaction because they've changed the picture. And then you have to wonder, has this picture changed? Can it change a politician in any way? Can art change that? It's an interesting question. And of course, if you're a, a viewer in this exhibition, they're doing what you're doing. Okay, sorry about that. Is there another question? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering if you could say uh, a little bit more about his relationship to Jeff Wall and Vancouver for the conceptualism, and perhaps if you see any kind of relationship, how he relates to American artists of the pictures generation. Just because in seeing you talk a lot about uh, about a lot of this work, I've thought a lot of the uh, of Louise Lawler, you know, and and some of the ways in which she makes work. I think. Um, I mean, even a picture like this, I think if Jeff Wall hadn't been making his own cinematic fictional pictures, I, I'm not sure, well, I, I'll just say it was certainly a precedent for this kind of work that Andrea started to do. Uh, and the feeling that a photograph could communicate something about the world we live in without having to document it. So there's an idea that you might want to represent something about the times we live in, but you don't have to use photography in a documentary way to do that. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, Andreas developed an interest really in talking about abstract painting. Um, Jeff Wall, and also uh, Luigi Gary is very interesting Italian conceptual photographer who worked a lot in the 70s, one of the first color photographers who also felt that photography as a way of making images had to have a dialogue with painting as, a, as, as, a, as the traditional way of having, you know, of imagery. That, that big image bank of painting, photography as another way of making images should be in dialogue with that rather than being a separate medium. So there's an idea that a photograph, eh, it's not really about photography, it's a way of making pictures. And I think, uh, and talking about pictures, and I think Gary, but also Jeff Wall more prominently, introduced that idea. And I think an artist like Andreas has really picked up on that and developed it in his own way. Any other questions? Uh, can you speak about, is this on? Do you hear me? Uh, can you speak about how, um, um, obviously you wanted to introduce those early photogra uh, photographs to the audiences because the later ones are much more known. And um, can you speak about how Andreas Gurski formulates questions in those early landscapes that he engages throughout his work and that are very important in these iconic um, later works which he manipulates. And also maybe why you, dis why you think it some sort of changes our idea of his oeuvre of knowing of these early landscapes. I think the, the helpful thing of getting a sense of what the early work is about is realizing early on that he's, the subject of these pictures is not what they depict. They're really about a r relationships, collective relationships to that idea of landscape. They're about landscapes that aren't necessarily what they appear to be, which is happening in this picture from 2011, which again references Barnett Newman but it's an image of a river outside of Bangkok. And if you look up close, you see that the river is filled with garbage and oil. And it's a picture really of environmental degradation. 
But when you see it from across the room, it's this beautiful shimmering image. And I've had people come up to me and say, oh, I love those pictures, they were so beautiful. And I said, did you go up close and look at it? Because it's the river is filled with floating condoms and uh, you know tires and garbage of every kind. And uh, the thing about Gorski is that you have to look at the pictures from two points of view. They really require a double vision. It's this going back and then coming up close. And that means that there's no one point of view where you can see it all. So there's no like single truth to the picture. It is beautiful, but it's also horrible. And that to me is really the sign of an interesting artist when you can embrace that kind of contradiction and you think, some people get upset, how could he make a beautiful picture of something that really is sad and tragic? The, the spoiling of our environment. And yet, how do you get people to look at it and to have a different experience of what it might be? It's a tricky question. Um, but I think, I mean, interestingly, I'll just jump ahead to, well, that's an interesting recent landscape of a solar installation in France. Um, but this picture, which is a new picture from this 2017, which was uh, a picture that's the first time in a long time, he's, in fact, I think ever, that he had a blurry image. And this is called Utah, and it's a scene taken from a car uh, in this part of Utah where actually a lot of science fiction and horror movies are made. And um, it's based on an image that he took with his iPhone when he was traveling and to me, it's, a f it's an epic version of an iPhone picture. He went back with big equipment to make this image, but he re basically, in the studio, then reconstituted all the defects that were in the iPhone image, including this strange glitch in the top third where you see this utility wire that's going across, the, the uh, that's interrupted. And it's a very ghostly image when you look up at it, when you look up close, because there's this, it's almost like a Richter painting, again, of this blurred landscape. And all the housing is very temporary housing. It looks like it won't be in this landscape and could disappear in a year. Uh, there's a real feeling of ephemerality. And it really, to me, evokes something of this idea of, you know, I think people like Gursky and Jeff Wall are very conscious of the fact that the type of picture they made and pioneered, this big, epic, painting-like photograph, is going out of fashion. That Younger artists working with photography aren't interested in continuing that legacy. They're into practices that are often much more studio-based. Uh, also, the idea that the most important photographic artifact of our time is the cell phone picture. That's what people share. That's what people, how we communicate. That's our common currency. So what then is the meaning of these big, epic photographs? How do you make that kind of picture today? And I think he's saying, uh, yes, you make this kind of picture by taking by having to refer to this other kind of picture with a mobile phone. You have to place this larger work in relationship to current, what's actually changing the way people think about pictures. Um, and there's one other picture he made with a, based on a mobile phone picture, which is this picture of a neighborhood in Tokyo, which was taken from a train. And when he went back to retake it, he rode the train 40 times and just, zeroed in on different buildings in this same neighborhood. So the neighborhood actually looks like that, but he's taking many, many different pictures so that he could play with what's in focus and what isn't. And the strange thing about this picture is that there's no, there's no really normal demarcation of what's in focus and what isn't. In the middle of the picture, something will be in focus and right next to it, something's out of focus. Uh, and when you're looking at it, it feels like it just is not resolving. Everything you know about how photographs are supposed to work isn't happening. And it's like you're watching your brain trying to make sense of this image. 
And he's also chosen this insane neighborhood where every roof is a different shape and color. I mean, I don't know about Toronto, but there's no neighborhood like this in London uh, or New York. So it's also this idea of these things that are very hard to resolve and make sense of. Um, it's it's very interesting new direction uh, that I think he's working in. So, you know, at the age of 63, he's still doing things that are really different. Um, and to me, that was also quite impressive that this picture was actually framed about three weeks before our show opened. Um, and, you know, he's now working on a picture of a robotics factory. I mean, I think he's still able to zero in on things that are looking at key pressure points where things are changing in the world in some way. Um, there's a, I just wanted your take on uh, some works uh, that I saw of Gursky. It might have been at the Venice Biennale uh, uh, a couple of years back. And the works that were the series on the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I found that uh, very disorienting and but very memorable those images uh, you know a, a map of the world a kind of a new map it felt like that where the continents were kind of pushed aside and it was more about the ocean but it wasn't the ocean that we're used to on a map it was this dark brooding deep blue thing and I just you know it, it was obviously something that was manipulated but it was also uh, kind of reminiscent of you know, Google images, but also something that didn't look like anything my brain had seen before. And I, and I wondered what your take was, because it was a very different photograph for Gursky, I thought. But it was, and I, it's, it's the only picture he didn't take himself, that series. He used satellite images. And so how he's working really, in that case, as a collage artist. But he's not trying to alter the reality of what that looked like. But he's using, say, a hundred different images to construct those things because if you have one big image that shows you that whole expanse of the ocean and the continents, you're not going to get very good detail. And what he's doing, why it looks unlike any image you've ever seen before, is because every square inch is as highly resolved in detail as it can be. But then to even create the sense of depths in the ocean, because the ocean from satellite point of view, all is just a dark, even surface. He then goes in and, like a painter, using depth charts and uh, recreates actually what the surface would look like if we had supernatural vision <laughs> and we were in outer space looking down. Um, but they do give you a sense of I mean, there's one amazing picture that we had on the show of Antarctica, which shows you the whole shape of this continent. And it looks like it's made of powdered sugar, and on the edges it's getting blown away. And, and you really get a sense of a continent in flux. It's not a static thing. Uh, very interesting. Thank you. So we have time for just one more question. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know what we can expect from Venice next year and what maybe your biggest like one challenge was in the difference between curating for the Venice Biennale and curating for the Hayward. Well, there are several big challenges. And one is the Hayward's really a great exhibition space and the spaces in Venice are not very good. Uh, I mean, they're really not great spaces for showing art. Uh, the other thing is that in Venice, people, I mean, Oak, we had 160 artists in his Biennale. Uh, people usually have at least 120. And I'm wondering whether it's possible to really make an exhibition that holds together with 120 artists. Or if you just don't worry about that, maybe a Biennale is not really an exhibition. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of debate. You know, I know people say, well, first of all, a good Biennale has to be a good exhibition. But I think a Biennale is really a civic event. Every Biennale has the name of a city attached to it. 
Um, it's not primarily really an exhibition. No one who wanted to make a good exhibition would come up with this set of rules, right? It's completely insane. Um, Venice is also just, and it's grueling. You know, I mean, by the time you come to the end of this 300 meter stretch of the Arsenale, I usually want to kill myself <laughs> um, because you can't process 600 works by 80 artists who are all doing totally different things. So the biggest challenge, one of them, is structural. Is there actually a better way to use that space and a, a better way to have the relationships between the artists who are in the show articulated? And um, I'm getting some inklings that maybe there is but of course, you, till you try it out, you don't know. <laughs> and um, so that is a big challenge. I have no idea what the theme is gonna be. Um, I'm trying to first see, look at lots of art around the world and see what holds up for me, and what seems really strong, what's worth facing, using as pillars of the exhibition and then finding the theme from the art rather than thinking like, oh yeah, I got the idea ahead of time and everything has to fit into it. So it's definitely a ground up process. Um, and it's just, you know, you just don't have enough time. <laughs> I think that's uh, as good an, as a philosophical point as we're gonna get to end this talk. So uh, please join me, everyone, in thanking Ralph for delivering this talk. Thanks again. Thank you. I'll just say one last thing. This image, actually, which was in the show, and then Andreas took it out, uh, even though we had to hire a crane just for one day to remove it, shows him uh, in this environment, which is replicates the wall of this music club in Frankfurt he used to go to a lot. But this isn't the real wall. He used the same software that the architects of that club used to design it to create a digital version and that's him kneeling, holding a piece of the wall, trying to figure out where it might go. And to me, this is not really a self-portrait, but a portrait of his working method. It's really this idea that this is how you work now. This is how you make a picture. You don't take a picture, you make it piece by piece. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs>